will conduct a question and answer session. In order to ask your question, press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Today's conference call is being recorded. If you have any objections, please disconnect. I will now turn the call over to your conference host, Mr. Jared Liu. Sir, you may begin. Great. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for joining us. This is the third, uh, the Thursday webcast series. It's a bi-monthly webcast held at the lunch hour. The trainings leverage local successes by amplifying to a larger audience to model organizations, methods, materials, and approaches. Sessions are planned to last no more than one hour, with two presenters speaking on the same topic from slightly different perspectives, each for 10 to 15 minutes, followed by 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answers. Today's session is approved by the ISA for one CEU hour and by SAF for one CFE. If you haven't already given me your certification number, you can email me after this session. Also, most state landscape architecture boards require only a certificate of completion, which ACT is happy to provide to members who request as well. This is a program of the Alliance for Community Trees, and we encourage you to consider joining if you're not a member. I want to thank today's sponsors uh, for the call, the Home Depot Foundation and the USDA Forest Service. Today's session is Green Jobs Part 3, From Incarceration or Probation to Employment. City neighborhoods with the highest levels of crime and unemployment also often have the fewest number of trees and least amount of green space. Green job training programs developed in accordance with the needs of struggling communities can be part of the solution to these issues. Programs for teaching and employing far formerly incarcerated youth and adults in the growing green economy can help reduce social and economic imbalances while, al while also cleaning and greening our cities. Today's first speaker will be B.J. Cordova. B.J. is the Director of Programs at Tucson Clean and Beautiful, of which Trees for Tucson is the flagship program. B.J. has also served as Recycling Education Coordinator and Director of Development and Community Outreach at Tucson Clean and Beautiful, and has coordinated the Adopt-a-Park program. Tucson Clean and Beautiful is a nonprofit whose mission it is to preserve and improve the environment, conserve natural resources, and enhance the quality of life in the city of Tucson and eastern Pima County. Uh, the organization's activities include educational and particip participatory programs implemented with broad citizen multicultural support, and we're pleased to have BJ with us today. Good morning or afternoon, wherever you are. So today I'd like to present to you just a little bit about our um, YARDS program, the Youth Achieving Resource Development Skills this program was actually put together by our executive director, Joan Leonetti, who apologizes for not being here, but she's actually on her way to the East Coast as we speak. Um, also, I would like to introduce Ronnie Olson, who is our brand new Trees for Tucson program coordinator uh, and has been helping Joan with this new program. And just in the background, just walked in the door, is Dave Stadel, who is also one of the co-directors of the program. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, there's us. So um, the YARDS program objectives, we're looking at a number of different things, um, trying to combine vocational training. Um, there's a major shortage here in the Tucson metro area of qualified landscapers who have basic skills, arbor, arbor skills, horticultural skills, and the like, um, but also an acute shortage of uh, potential jobs for youth who have been through some type of uh, disciplinary action. And so we're trying to find ways to provide training and certification at least on some basic skills so that they can continue to improve their job prospects and hopefully not end up back in the juvenile or even adult uh, court system again. And uh, we provide a variety of different uh, types of training, everything from basic uh, job skills in, in the landscaping industry to uh, personal skill development and all the way up to um, different types of training and even a, a sort of a bonus course they got to do some uh, tree climbing uh, with uh, ropes and equipment and the like. So I'm actually going to turn it over to Ronnie to continue explaining this, but at the end of the, uh, the coursework that the students go through, they do receive a certificate and also get a, a small set of uh, basic landscaping tools so that whether or not they choose to pursue a formal employment, they could even do uh, landscaping and the like in their own neighborhoods. So with that, Ronnie, can I turn this over to you? Great. So um, the, this is the YARDS program, and um, 
we had a lot of very diverse uh, professionals that were involved in the entire program with facilitating uh, the classes and making sure that um, the kids were getting a diverse background of skills in landscaping um, and in job training in general. Um, the um, Joan, who's the executive director, um, she wrote this program um, just over six years ago. Um, and then after solidifying most of the content, uh, took it to the National Urban and Community Forestry Advisory Council. Um, and uh, to no avail, they, they said that she, uh, they were not going to fund the YARDS program because there was no product. So the, um, the program itself kind of got put on the back burner until it was uh, later funded by the Wolf Lager Foundation um, out of Texas. The, uh, each year, this is the first year, and we're just starting our second course. Um, each year, there will be three programs. Um, they're eight-week courses. Um, the ninth week is a graduation. Um, the class size is limited to 15 students. Um, and the way that the students are picked is they're first selected um, from their probation officer. Um, and they're, they're looked at based on... Um, the assessment of the youth's aptitude and desire to complete the whole program, the eight-week course. Um, <clears throat> the maximum class size, like I said, I guess it's 12 students. Um, and uh, I guess we'll just go to the... Great. So um, th the next few slides are just going to walk you through what the eight weeks of the first class that we did. Um, the first class... Um, we had we have a really good support in the community. Um, we had speaker um, Sarah Sally Simmons, who's the presiding judge for the uh, Pima Juvenile Courts. Um, we also have Richard Elias um, and several people from Parks and Rec. Um, Joan and transportation. And transportation um, we have horticulturists and arborists. Um, the University of Arizona's uh, College of Architecture and Landscape Architecture is also involved. Um, Joan and Dave Staddle, who is in the background here, um, the two of them have been working to put this whole program together, and it's really both of their efforts that has made this possible, along with the, the funding of the Wolf, Wolf, Wolf Lager Foundation. Um, so this first class um, that we had was just a basic orientation with some of those guest speakers that I mentioned. Um, and then after the first portion, we went over um, the potential of getting jobs after the fact after graduating this course. Um, the, the Pima County Parks and Rec are on board with trying to get these kids summer jobs. They're bumped up on the list um, for youth programs for summer jobs. Um, and the last, the last program of that first class, we went over tools um, and, and safety techniques with the different tools that they would likely be using. Um, in the second class, it was an identification of desert and desert-adapted plants. Um, and, and in this, this whole course, we had a lot of learning. There was a lot of learning on our half of making sure that the kids were actively engaged with the lessons that they were being taught. Um, they did retain a lot, and this, this, this second class was a really great example because we had a, um, a, a wonderful person come in that knew a lot about desert adapted plants. Um, but it ended up being much more lecture than I think that any of us were comfortable with. So those were the kind of things that we, we ended up um, learning in the long run of making sure that whoever's speaking really was able to connect with these kids and didn't just know the information but was able to communicate that information to this very specific population of youth. Uh, the third course that we had was uh, plants, soil, water, and their relationships. Um, and we had some uh, some professionals come in and did some hands-on examples of the different soil types that we have out here in the desert, which are very unique. <laughs> um, only really desert-adapted plants are suited in this environment, and so the soil, um, from most of where everyone's listening to, um, is very different <laughs> than any other place um, ar around our, our uh, nation. Um, as a tailgate, we also had, um, and by tailgate, we we kind of developed this uh, short little 30-minute section each class called a tailgate safety. And the idea is that landscapers, 
set out on the tailgate and they have a little kind of like a small talk um, about information that everybody should know, whether it's a tool that's not working properly or um, issues that are coming up on the job site. And so the tailgate is really just a 30-minute small talk on specific issues. Um, so on the third class, we had a germ city, and somebody came in from the university and um, talked about um, making sure that you sanitize not only your tools after you're using them, but also your hands um, and keeping them safe from, from getting bacteria um, in your mouth, really. <laughs> um, okay, so the fourth course we have planting uh, plant sites and plant selection, and that was really just to go over that there are appropriate locations for these plants to be and there are inappropriate locations and kind of the, the relationship that plants have um, with each other in, in a designated spot. Um, and we went over our, the tailgate for that day was food safety um, and what, what is a, you know, what's appropriate to take on a job site for your lunch at, in the middle of July when it's in the 100 degree temperature um, to make sure that the food doesn't spoil and you get food poisoning. Um, then we're, uh, we went into the plant health, weeds, and fertilizers um, and identified what a healthy plant is, uh, how to identify a diseased plant or a plant that was um, needing some extra attention. And then we had a tailgate on um, sun in Arizona and skin cancer. Uh, Arizona is the second leading um, area in the world, aside from Australia, for uh, skin cancer. So it's kind of a big deal for us here in making sure that people that are working outside in the sun are being protected. Um, and the kids really did like a lot of these hands-on things, getting pictures that are uh, a little bit gruesome for some of us. Um, for the sixth course, we had um, a pruning course, and, and possibly this was the most successful because the kids were really outside doing a lot of hands-on work. Um, they were actually being able to prune the trees themselves that were in um, the um, extension services, which is where we, we taught these courses. Um, so they were able to get out and um, identify what bad pruning was um, and also do some appropriate pruning and, and identifying how, how it was best to do that. Um, then we went into um, irrigation installation and management, which in the landscaping professional uh, profession is one of the more technical skills. Um, and it is interesting to see how some of the kids gravi gravitated towards different disciplines throughout these eight weeks. Um, and we definitely did see a few of the kids that gravitated more towards the technical um, side of landscaping, which is the irrigation and um, how to install it and the different components that fit together and how, how it's also done wrong, because <laughs> that's, that's something that happens a lot in our field as well. Um, and then we also had um, a tailgate um, on poisonous critters. Um, in the Arizona desert, we have um, a lot of... Uh, poisonous life out here, whether it's a poisonous plant or it's scorpions um, or it's bees. We have a lot of bees as well or rattlesnakes and how to deal with those type of things because they are in the, they're in the trees. <laughs> they're everywhere. They're in the ground hiding and they're also in the trees when people are pruning. So it's how to be safe and what to do when you do encounter one of those. Um, we had a special section that was specifically geared towards um, job skills and how to get a job. Um, and we had a, a wonderful woman come in and talk about, um, now I have an education, how about a job? So we went over some mock um, um, interviews and we had a few different people that were in the class. Dave, um, I also did it and, and Joan kind of did these mock uh, presentations on interviewing some of the kids and they got up in groups of two so it would be a little bit more comfortable and did a we, we kind of pre all pretended to be a different type of person, whether it was a, a nosy neighbor or somebody that owned their own landscaping business and um, what are appropriate ways to present yourself as and what are some other ways that, um, that are inappropriate <laughs> that could help you not get a job. Um, let's see. So the last week, um, that eighth week, was a recap of all of the previous seven weeks that we had. Um, and we did a lot of hands-on work outside, um, looking at how to do irrigation, um, the different soil types, 
kind of doing a, a 15 minute recap of all of those weeks and then had a discussion about um, any questions that anybody had. And then we had what was called, I guess we called it a questionnaire, which was essentially a multiple question test. Um, and I think for, for most of us there, what was more surprising is how much information these kids retained. And they were able to describe a lot of the things that um, I think even some of the adults in the classroom had, had forgotten. So it was, it was reassuring um, throughout all of these weeks to kind of come to a close and to understand that they came in not knowing very much about landscaping um, and the desert in general and leaving having a much better, much more rounded understanding of, of that profession um, and having some knowledge to understand why, why some of the things are the way that they are, um, what's proper pruning and what is pruning that, um, that can actually kill some of the trees out here. Um, we did also have a visit from the Wolfslager Foundation, um, two of the people that, were, that are from the Wolfslager, which is the, um, the funding source that we had, came out and spent half of a day with these kids and um, were, were quite thrilled and very excited, um, as were we, to have them out. Um, we also had um, the, uh, quite a bit of media coverage throughout this program, more towards the end. Um, we had the, some local news stations um, film some of the kids, and um, to, have, to, to get that actually done, um, Dave maybe had to jump through <laughs> more hoops than any of us uh, would, have, would have liked to have happened, but it did, get, it did happen, and Dave was able to um, get in contact with um, and get permission from a couple of the kids' parents. Um, to have them interviewed on the news. Um, and, and we did come into another issue, which is um, the interviewer from the station, um, you know, asked, asked some questions that definitely would have gotten a, a great response rate on the news, which was, why are you guys here? What did you do? But it's an inappropriate question. And so Joan overheard this and jumped in and said, you kids don't need to answer that. It's, it's just that one more level of making sure that these kids are being protected and that the media isn't, isn't getting out of hand. Um, we also had um, some great articles in our local green magazine or uh, local green newspaper called Tucson Green Times, um, as well as the um, Arizona Daily Star. Um, and finally, we had um, the ninth day of the graduation. We had um, we started off doing um, a, a tree climbing session where we had a professional tree climber come out and gear them up, harness them in, and they actually got to experience what it was like to climb a tree, which is um, which is a profession that does give quite a bit of um, quite a bit of money. And I think at the very beginning of the course, all these kids were pretty impressed by um, the kind of money that one could potentially make in landscaping, um, and then again in the tree climbing and. I think that was one of the best ways to cap off the whole um, eight-week session is to have these kids get up there and do some very physical um, rock climbing-like experience. In fact, um, that was intended as a reward, and it's actually now going to be part of the curriculum for the for the current session that's underway and in the future. Um, and then after that, those couple hours in the morning, um, the actual graduation ceremony happened. Um, we had several speakers come out. Um, Part of our within our community, um, we had Richard Elias, which is part of the um, he's the supervisor for Pima County Pima County Board of Supervisors. Um, we had um, the judge that also came the first day, um, Judge Sally. Um, we had people come out from Parks and Rec. We had the um, director of the University of Arizona's Architecture and Landscape Architecture Department. Um, we had some people part of our community college. Um, that came out and spoke as well, um, and did actually the one of the uh, board of governors from the Pima Community College here approached Joan and Dave, um, wanting to give these kids uh, college credit for this course. So that's actually in the works right now, um, and uh, hopefully in the next few months these kids will be getting three uh, three units of college credit as well. So just a couple of final notes. Um, this was definitely a major effort in partnership. Um, Tucson Clean and Beautiful working with Pima, Pima County Juvenile Court. The CREW program is the, the juvenile court uh, 
basically a community service and restitution program. So that program's officers actually were supervising the youth during the yard's sessions. There was at least one, if not a couple, sometimes on hand, uh, basically in the background. And they, they were basically taking the course along with the students, more or less. Um, but definitely a lot of partnership in this and uh, stretching resources far beyond what we could have done with the, the budget. And so. And in, in, the, in the graduation, it just kind of brought to light Again, this population that we are dealing with, um, we had a lot of um, flyers for these kids to take home to their to their parents and to the to the people in their community that they were associated with for them to attend the graduation, and um, it br just brought to light how how little support um, a lot of these kids' families are able to give or are willing to give. Um, there were only of the eight graduating kids, there were only two that um, had any family members. Um, participate in the graduation or show any interest. So, again, we're dealing with a population of, of kids that, you know, we had a transportation issue where one of the students um, who's very bright and very willing um, to be a part of the course um, had trouble getting to the class, so he missed a couple of the sessions. Um, I think largely because he was probably just a little bit embarrassed to say that he was having a transportation issue. So those are some of the things of the lessons learned that were um, – so we're trying to, to uh, uh, I don't know, fix for this for this second course and and for the courses um, after this as well. So there were a lot of different things that went into organizing the program, and I'm sure that people who have planned programs before are aware of all of these. But every time you have to look at the funding issues, you come up with a new name and new logo for this. Uh, the classrooms, the the schedules having to shift around constantly. Um, seeing, again, that there's some level of community or family support, and in some cases there may not be, but the students have to be self-motivated. Uh, storing and uh, maintaining all these tools, arranging the instructors and uh, having not employees but either independent contractors or basically people donating their time, um, and alternate instructors if somebody can't make it at the last minute. We definitely um, ask the students to evaluate anonymously each session, and uh, out of that, we got a lot of feedback. Again, less lectures, more hands-on and interactive uh, presentations. Uh, but so that the students feel empowered that this is their course. Um, we do provide them with a binder with all the handout materials that they're given so they can continue to use that as a reference, um, making sure that people do make the, the graduation requirements. And then also, um, juvenile court has a tracking system anyway, hoping to, over the longer term, make sure that these students don't return to their system, um, but having some data on that in the future. And then also continuing to identify opportunities for, for jobs, and also we're working on uh, obtaining community college credits for the students. So with that, we'd certainly like to open up for questions for just a couple of minutes. Dave, do you have anything you want to add? Fantastic, thanks. Um, Catherine, can you open the lines for questions, please? Certainly. At this time, if you would like to ask her a question, please unmute your phone, press star 1, only record your first and last name. To withdraw your question, you may press star 2. So once again, to ask your question, press star 1. One moment for the first question. Great. And if, uh, if you don't want to ask a question yourself or if you're just more inclined to type it in, there's a Q&A tab at the top of your screen, and you can type your question there. And I'll come on the line and read the question for you. Um, so I, I guess I'll, BJ and Ronnie, very much. I'll, I'll pick up on uh, where you left off with, you know, some of the more specifics, uh, specifically the funding, since uh, many of the folks we're speaking to are in the nonprofit audience. That's usually where uh, our minds first go. Sure. Uh, I guess, I mean, can, can you take us through some of, you know, how you uh, marketed this and anything you can uh, disclose about what the cost of the program is and, you know, if it's boiled down to a per pupil cost, but, you know, in general, if someone's thinking about if they can get funding for this, you know, where should they go, how much is this going to cost, type questions. So this, uh, as we mentioned, was originally presented to the to NUCFAC, the National Urban and Community Forestry Advisory Council, um, who did deny the funding. We thought we had a surefire grant source there to get this off the ground, so it took us another three years to find another source, which was one of our current uh, or past grantee uh, grant givers for another project. 
Um, we had the Children's Memorial Park renovation uh, on the north side of Tucson, which was uh, $50,000 from the Wolfslager Foundation. They were very thrilled with us. So certainly, I think based with any of your past funding sources that you had a successful grant with um, a few years later and saying, hey, we've got this new dental project. Um, the Wolfslager Foundation initially gave us, I believe it was 34000 and some change uh, for the first year of the program. So that's been a lot of costs in setting up, getting tools, uh, making all the initial arrangements as well as the expenses for instruction and the like. Um, and then, we, yeah, we also, this was not um, in the grant, but they offered a second year half matching grant of $18,000. So we're presently raising funds uh, for 2011's programs and then looking for longer-term funding sources as well, whether that's a mixture of public and private dollars, um, continuing to build on the success of the current program through in-kind. You know, a lot of the services we've been getting have been at extremely reduced or even free cost. So the, the cost of the program in the future um, on a per-person count will continue to go down because we won't have to purchase as many supplies. Um, but other than that, multiple sources of funding um, certainly would be necessary for something like this, but also the cooperation that goes into it tends to build that. Uh, it'd be even a juvenile uh, justice grant is being looked at right now, correct? We're jointly looking at some of our uh, through our court uh, approaches. And then additionally, the Wolfslager Foundation, the comment from the representative from that organization was that they typically don't go into the ground floor. They want to be involved with programs that already have a proven track record. But he was so impressed with the representation from the community, the stakeholders that were involved in the pre-planning from the, from the beginning. We both had private sector and governmental sector and nonprofit representation. We really had to, quote, take the risk. And they were very pleased so far with the outcome. So thank you, Jared. Sure. Um, was the space donated, or where did you host the sessions? I missed that. Yes, it was donated space at the Pima County Agricultural Extension Service and U of A Cooperative Extension Office. Uh, basically, they have what they call the campus farm, which covers a couple of sides of a major thoroughfare in town. Uh, it used to be on the edge of town, but now is practically in the middle of the city. Mm. And so, yeah, the office space was donated. They have actually uh, providing... Uh, not office space, but the conference space. They've also allowed us to set a small storage container on site. Uh, what is it, 20 feet long? Uh, yeah. Um, so that we can have a secure place that's not bothering their staff for keeping our tools and supplies all in one place rather than having to slip that back and forth to and from the office. I think the other question I have that's maybe nonprofit specific is, um, you know, a lot of the groups that we work with, the uh, the mission of the organization reads similar to yours, and there isn't necessarily a component in there that says something about serving underserved communities or working with uh, at-risk populations and such. So how did you come to that this was an important program for you, um, and, you know, how, how does how does it fit in with the mission? And I mean, I, I think I can answer my own question, but just to hear you say it. Sure, absolutely. So we, we work with the park staff, transportation staff, and communities all over throughout the Tucson metro area, and it's always been identified first that there is a lack of skilled landscapers. Um, a lot of fly-by-night, not, not to mean that everybody does a bad job, but that there's a lack of technical knowledge. And at the same time, there are plenty of youth that need skills, that need um, a way to not get in trouble, uh, to gain valuable skills. And it's uh, important to note that many of these students are still in traditional uh, or even alternate schools. Um, I don't I don't think there was more than just one or two that were actual dropouts, correct, Dave? Correct. And these kids, uh, some of them, but not all of them, have been involved in our in the field building, which is the standard uh, work crew restitution approach. So we are identifying kids that are involved in those work crews. And additionally, some of the kids I mentioned that are not involved in that, the probation officers are always involved in, in the screening and education of these kids. But the idea was that the kids are in the system, 
that there is a combination of a need in the community. We need to fulfill, in, in a lot of cases, requirements through the court, but also there's the reality that they can benefit through this educational and this vocational approach. So it's a win-win combination all the way across. One of the things we're trying to do through this as well is get them out of the traditional, you know, you have to go and clean up other people's litter and paint over other people's graffiti sort of thing and actually get them some useful skills that are not just very entry level. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, they are entry level skills for a, a formal landscape job, but really on the grander scale of things, but several unskilled laborers walking in the door with no resume as opposed to somebody who may have a, a brief resume plus a certification. You know, we did provide them all with a letter of recommendation uh, saying we feel that they would be certainly good for any of these and have these skills so that an employer knows what this little certificate means. They have gotten some formal training that they could continue to build, uh, build their skills as they train their potential employee. And I think you started to answer this, but um, have the students been able to, or has the program translated into jobs for the students, whether summer or full time, and have the kids stayed out of the court system, or is it too early to report on that yet? The immediate approach with this first session was that we had uh, timing was going into the summer. We have a summer youth program that's federal through federal money, it's channeled through the Board of Supervisors with the county, and all these kids were given priority as far as being uh, eligible for that. They didn't have a, an instant give as far as positions go, but they did have a identification as, as far as priority goes. Several of the kids have gone through the preliminary testing that's required for all participants. At this point, um, they are waiting calls from the county as far as uh, being channeled into that program. At the same time, we have received feedback from the private sector. A lot of our presenters uh, have come in and said that they will definitely uh, be identifying these kids if they are channeled towards them, and then they come with their certificates, but they're definitely uh, interested in having that population. So our next step as we go into these next sessions, obviously a, a lot of energy was channeled into getting the program going and the educational forum uh, on track. Our next step here heading into these other sessions is to go ahead and, and further develop that, the job development aspects of that during the time that the, the, the session is operating and then to have uh, further channels as we go out. The additional uh, benefit here is that it's been mentioned about Pima College uh, support of this and there is dialogue and direction going and it looks very favorable for us to be implementing a uh, college credit aspect of this also. So there's been meetings with the Board of Governor representative and one of the deans from Pima College, and it looks like that's definitely going to be on track for kids that are going through this program to be able to be um, receiving college credit through Pima College. And they have an active landscaping uh, educational component there, both directly onto the job certificate and then in, into further degrees. So we're very optimistic uh, about that part, too. And, and these credits would be retroactive. They're, they're working to make sure that that first class that they graduated um, would also benefit from the, the college credits. It wouldn't just be future, future uh, classes. Great. Catherine, do you have any questions in queue? Time. Uh, does the operator have any questions in queue? Oh, no. Sorry. I cut in there. I heard it at the end. Great. Okay. Um, well, thank you uh, to the uh, Tucson Cleaning Beautiful crew. We'll uh, move on to Annette, and if uh, there are additional questions for you, folks can hold those till the end. All right. Uh, up next, we have Annette Williams, who is the coordinator for the Bronx Environmental Stewardship Training Program, formerly known as River Heroes. She recruits and trains South Bronx and New York City residents in restoring and maintaining the Bronx River, the parks and gardens. She also provides job readiness training and advocates for environmental justice. She came to Sustainable South Bronx after seven years with the New York Restoration Project in Manhattan, where she served as Vice President of Community Outreach and Programming. We are pleased to have Annette Williams with us. Good afternoon or good evening to wherever you are, and thank you for having me. So yes, my name is Annette Williams, and I work for Sustainable South Bronx, where I run the job training program called BEST. 
Bronx Environmental Stewardship Training Program. And in our program, um, we started in 2003, um, and we only started with one track at the time, and it was Best Ecology, formerly known as River Heroes. And what started that out was in 2001, um, our founder, Majora Carter, um, and myself was working with 500 AmeriCorps members around um, the United States to go in and make the Bronx Survey and bring it up to become its natural resource that it's supposed to be doing a great cleanup. And as we came back and sat at the table after those four days, we realized on account of our hands that we only seen that like, we at that time was only Bronx. So we called them the Bronxites. was none from our, our own community help cleaning and maintaining the Bronx River. Um, within a couple years, Majora looked for grants that would start something that would we would be the training partner and find someone that would be on the Bronx River being the entity to have year-round cleanup crew that will go out there and learn how to maintain this river um, from the stream banks to the trees to planting new gardens, removing invasives, and then being the um, ones that help put back fish into the water so things will start coming back to its natural. Um, one thing that happened here is we use a lot of environmental justice to promote who we are, and we did a lot of parades, a lot of things where we dress up and say all this toxic air is hurting us. We have the highest asthma rate in the in the New York City, and to let that be known is in parks in New York City, people have five acres to every hundred people. If we have one acre in Hounds Point. At that time, it would have been good. Um, I think we had a half acre park and our treescape and what we're now calling our street, street tree um, landscape here in Hunts Point was so minimal it was ridiculous. Here in Hunts Point, a week, 60,000 trucks come in and out of Hunts Point. So with that, we had to find ways to also let everyone understand why we do what we do, but when we get our trainees in the program, let them understand so they become um, ambassadors for their own community to help fight off all and bring back new. Every time you stop at a school, stop the school, you will find, have to build a jail. What you gain at one, you end, you lose at the other. It's like feeding a dog its own tail. It won't fatten the dog by Mark Twain. And we live by a lot of quotes here because it helps us remember where we come from. Our mission here at Sustainable South Bronx is, is a community organization dedicated to environmental justice solutions through innovative and economical sustaining projects that are formed by the community needs. Again, by John Moore, love this because it encompasses everything that we live and everything we want to live. The ease of sustainability for us is environment, economy, and equity. And with that, our environment and economy goes hand in hand. I don't think we really look at it like that in a full until recently. But we've been trying to see how that can make a fit for us and be the ease of sustainability that we need to provide in our job training program, in our policy team, in anything that we do here in Hunts Point and in the five boroughs of New York City. Um, and how that happens is we get environmental discard. So you have areas like this throughout Hunts Point, throughout the Bronx, throughout the five boroughs that are just trash, and we call it environmental discard. Years ago, um, one of the things that was happening in Hunts Point area, it was burning, and you kept hearing this, you know, when you were growing up, the Bronx is burning. And as the Bronx burned, this is all that the young people knew. They knew nothing else but the Bronx is burning. It's not sustainable for us here. And our founder lived through this era, um, the first African-American family to move in Hunts Point in the 1950s and stayed and still living here. And this is some of the stuff that she said started our movement to make it strong. So you think about it. You have all these children playing in these lots that they called was their fun time around buildings that were just abandoned, mindset, things that are going on. Um, where do you leave? Where are they going? 
in the USA is 5% world population, population to U.S. 25% what? And I ask this all the time, what is that other 25%? And believe it or not, in the United States, 25% of our young people, men and women, are incarcerated. We have uh, another thing we do here, green jobs and not jails. It started for with Green for All um, a year, two years ago, and we're still working hard because here in Hunts Point, they're still telling us they want to build a jail here. They put a barge here um, eight years ago, told us to only be here two years. It's still here eight years later. And now they're saying let's build some on Oak Point and make it sustainable so that, and they're, during the time the person that was in charge of our prison system said, Oh, at a meeting, the reason why we're doing it is you can come to be closer to see your children, your husband. That was not the right thing to say. He is no longer the commissioner, but that was his case to us to say why we need to put a jail closer to you so you can come visit your people. In order for things to happen, we're figuring and the world is figuring out we need to clean up the environment and produce jobs at the same time. Not putting our young men and women in prison and the ones that are coming out of prison, making it an open door that they then can be trained and filled to do this kind of work. The increasing amount of space being given to environmental issues is matched in column inches by the decrease in news about civil rights. Environmental issues and civil rights go hand in hand. We're like the um, canary in the coal mine. We feel like we're being caged in with everything around us, from pollution, from our power plants. And this is not only in our community, I know, in other communities, but this is our driving first because at one time or another, it closes up on us and we are no more able to breathe or do anything. And all you know is dirt. So what do you act like? What do you do like? Again, I'll bring this to your attention. South Bronx right now is higher. I have to be honest with you. Um, unemployment rate is almost at the low, biggest highs of almost 65%, and living under poverty is 60%. And medium income is less than 20%. We did a thing study the other day, and it was 15K. Who can live on that and survive without having to do the unmentionables to be able to support your family? So how do we combat that? We start Best Academy, and Best Academy took individuals from the age of 18 on and trained them in different things. So we have two tracks, Best for Ego, which is a 12-week environment remediation training program, um, and it trains individuals on ecology, horticultural, green roofs, green walls. We are now adding on primordial concrete. We are now doing rain barrel installation. Um, we are now going into the gardens, and they're learning how to do rock potting and how to um, install, maintain, and do ponds, and how to install and maintain. Its target population is 18 and up, um, and we look for everyone, under underemployed people of color, coming from every walk of life. Um, the training includes physical fitness, environmental health and safety, life skills, hands-on mentoring, industry-related math, job placement assistant. To go back to something, in our training time for Best Eco, they are able to get 10-hour OSHA, 40-hour hazmat, um, first aid CPR. We are now doing confined space, New York City tree pruning certification. They get peripheral concrete installer certification and rain garden um, installer and maintainer certification and live roof certification. So they walk away with eight certifications um, in that field. The life skills are done three weeks prior to us going out and doing our hands-on classwork so that they can understand what it is to get up on time, what is financial management. I get a job. How do I live? Not from check to check, but be able to save. So Capital One comes out and teaches our young men and women um, about finances, how to get your credit for it, and how to open up a business if that's what you're looking for. The so mentoring comes in with our alumni. We attach our alumni to someone that we see is in need of support. 
a lot of our young men and women are coming out of prison from 17 to 20 years being in prison. Some are five years, but our highest have been 27 years in prison. And they have family support. They have, we have now partnered with a lot of other organizations, and that's all they do is reentry. That's, I don't like making up a new will. If the will is out there, I, our, our organization partners with Osborne Society, with, um, anybody that's open to partner with us, um, Episcopal services and networking services that all deal with prison, prisoners that coming back out of reentry so that when they're getting to this point where they're not sure they know what to do while they're out here, if they're sure they're getting lost by us or they don't have the family support, we're able to find someone that went through our program that has come into the reentry and graduate our program, becomes their mentor, so then we give them some, a partner to help on with the other stuff that they are so skilled to do. The industry math we do, because there's a lot of landscaping. So in the three weeks, they get almost um, 10 hours of industry math, making sure they understand the ruler, the measurement, so on and so forth. Job placement, we have two job developers on site, um, and we track our guys for three years after. Um, the program's been going for eight. I can say we're tracking everyone for eight years. You, it's about sustainability, them knowing that you're there for them, that we're there to help them. And what we also do in our mentoring program is myself and my assistant, we, we go out to our um, potential employers, ask them, what, would it, what does an employee look like to you from us? Are we doing the right trainings? Are we hitting the target that you need to, to say to me, I have open positions, who do you have to put, to put in these places? Do we need to add on more life skills? Do we need to add on more job readiness? And I listen to the employers because at the outcome of it, they need to be employed. Um, so we're able to do that. And then at the same time, we offer where I will be a mediator. So instead of firing someone, call me and say, person's been absent. The person's not standing up to its task. And I will come in and mediate before they decide to let them go to find out what's going on. How can we make this better? Is this the place you still want to be at? Is it that much difficult for you to keep this job here? So I go on with the employer and the employee to try to target so they don't lose their job and they stay where they can stay on a ladder and grow. That's Best Eco. Um, Best for Buildings just started um, in 2009. We started our pilot. We're going to start off small again, and I really think starting off small is the key. I, and I didn't mention we were Best Eco. We started off the first um, year with five months, seven people. The next year, six people, five months. Able to be able to grow able to look at your mistakes and take it as, you know, evaluation for everything that you're doing and how it can grow. As we did that, you know, we got input from funders, input from our trainers that we use, input from um, environmental health and safety um, programs on how this program should be looked at. You, we are very much uh, innovative. We're very much able to take a program and change in a nick of time to make it fit so they become viable employer, employees. Um, so now we're at the Best Eco, three times a year doing trainings. 20 to 25 people are in our training classes. So we went to Best for Buildings, and 2009 we started that we do it for 17 weeks, 17 to 20 weeks, to see what this um, retrofit and weatherization training program will look at. We took on seven people. We decided to add on the BPI, Building Performance Institute, um, class and let them take the test and the fill test. And we decided that then it was good. It, it, we, had, we had hit a lot. We, what we try often with both sets is it's a hands-on training. So they get their three weeks where they're doing all this life skills and job readiness and team building exercises, and then they start to go out in the field and actually do the work. So our trainer will come into the class for a day or half a day, and then for two days to all the rest of the time they're out with us, they're doing field stuff. So they're planting trees, they're pruning trees, they're doing string bank restoration work, they're putting on waders, going in and removing blockages out of the Bronx River going and actually building a rock garden in an area of um, one of the parks department parks 
that has just been totally weeded and making that beautify. So they're stepping back and be able to see their work and what they're learning. We try to do the same for Best for Buildings, where they're going to learn how to put up windows, weatherize windows and doors. They need to have a place to do that. So we go into people's homes twice in a building, and we take this building and we do a complete weatherization in the building, changing out aerators, changing bulbs, looking at their weather stripping of their doors, looking at their windows. If it's more than what we can do, we then um, have this program we're working with now, Green Jobs, Green New York, where we're then able to say, we're looking to say to you that your, your apartment, your home needs to be completely audited. And then it goes to the next step to our next partner. Um, but it's all hands-on. We have um, our classroom where we go do plumbing for a week, and they learn from the plumbing from the CSOs where the water falls at, how to change it, how to make it green, how to look at any aspect of the home and how it works, and what does it mean to be green. How do you go into a person's home and audit their home? So we have energy efficiency technician training by AEA for eight days, and then they are certified. We were, our class was the first class last session to go through this program. We even used Sherman Williams, Sherman Williams painting course. And in that painting course, they are then certified as homework helpers, painters. In that course, Sherman Williams has also took on the EPA new lead renovator training where if you are a painter, you need to now, as a painter, and it's law in New York State, have this certification under your belt in order to paint and remove lead. So we're looking at things that will make them viable employees. So, again, they in Best Eco, they're not coming out as landscapers, but they're coming out with so many other tools and skills under their pocket that they can cover what they need. So if they want to go into green roofing, they know about the green roofs, they know about the plants. They know how to maintain them. If they want to go into a landscape company, they can go into a landscape company. Let's just say they hit something in the ground. They see it's hazardous waste. They know then, you know, what's that? I'm going to keep digging until I find They don't know. Stop. Call my boss. This hazardous waste under their ground. We can't go forth. That tree can't be planted there. So that they're, getting, they're going to be so viable to the employer that they're a great resource. In our Best for Buildings, we have up the age from 18 to 45 because we're realizing some of the individuals that are coming from reentry are a little older, and we want to be able to have placements for them and be able to train people in that. Um, again, that training includes the same as um, eco, but the math is industry-related math. Um, that just goes so they'll be able to pass anything they want to go into the unions. We now have um, a lot of people in, our, in the unions that have just graduated, and we want to make sure that they'll be able to pass that test. We do a little more industry math with our best for building skies. Again, best – oh, I came back, sorry. So in Best Academy, our criteria – is 18 years or older for both programs. We have said, and just it's become just real to us here in, in the Bronx and New York City, that they must have a high school diploma or GED. Um, if they don't have it, we try our best. If they're really, really hungry to have this happen, we will find a GED program to get them placed in um, and make sure that they're, they're going to have their GED before they finish the program or either took the test. Um, especially if they're a, a candidate that is really strong and eager to get this. We do the TAE testing, so they have to pass eighth grade reading and math level only for best for buildings. Best for eco, we do sixth grade. One of the things I think is very highly effective for us, and we have a complete recruitment process where these individuals are coming out at least four times to see me and my staff. So the candidate must follow the first application and intake. So they come in, fill out the application, we review it, ask some questions, find out which program they want to go down. They come back again for an orientation that's almost two hours long where we really go into each specific thing that we do in each program. Um, 
question and answer so they really go back and be able to research what it is to be a retrofitter, what is it to be um, weatherization, what is it to be an auditor. Now you have all these tools and skills. We say go back and look this stuff up and see where you want to go and is this going to be something that you can go into a career, not a job. We're trying to get our individuals into careers. And then we have what we call a one-day or two-day tryout. But everybody that applied for Best for Buildings, Best for Eco, comes back and does tryouts. Our tryouts include being here at 7.45 in the morning. They get exercise for an hour, physical fitness. Then we go into team building um, settings. So we have laid out four to five different um, areas where they go in. They break up into teams. They name their team, become a team to conquer, and we call it conquer and gain all the knowledge you can and make each thing that you're going into work for your team. So by the time you finish, you've done all five of the activities, but you learned something about your team, about yourself, and about eco, ecology, buildings, math. And what that does for us, it shows if they're a team player, if they're going to be able to work through this program, are they really, and I use this word, very much hungry for change in their own lives. Um, while they're here, we give them unlimited Metro cards for both programs, and we do $5 a day for lunch. So the first three weeks, we are ordering them lunch at 7.45 in the morning. You've got to be on time because you're having, um, by 8 o'clock, you're in the physical fitness room doing physical fitness. So your lunch is ordered and already placed out. If you're late, sorry, you don't get, you, your lunch is not for you for this day. Once they're going out into the field, we give them $5 a day um, as they come out to the field to do their work for lunch to make sure they have water in their body and they're prepared to do the kind of work that they need to be done. Best Ecology, this is one of the green roofs that we do, and it's just a process we go through and some of the things, other things that we're doing. Um, we do pesticide uses solar panel, so we're doing solar panels and solar thermal training and nursery management. Also included in there is USDA and Maritime College does our soil and water um, testing and teaches the, um, our young men and women how to do the testing. One of the things that we like to do is we call it a toxic tour. Um, our young ladies walk around with the class and teach them about the environmental justice that's in our community. And then when they go back to there, they could spot, you know, that is environmental justice. We have so many sewer waste treatment facilities in our town. This is why our asthma is so high. So we educate them on where they live. A green roof that they help install and maintaining um, the soil with USDA, water quality. We also do fish invertebrates and vertebrates and go from the Bronx Sound of the Bronx River up to Westchester County and see the difference in the size of the um, invertebrates and everything else that's in there to show how contaminated the water is. They're growing bigger down here now because they're cleaning, but in Westchester you see the difference. Um, so now we have the different things that we're doing. Our tree climbing program, green wall program, our best for buildings, on roofs, doing constructions, gutting someone's home, making it better, showing them the difference of regular windows to um, energy efficiency windows and our solar panels. Again, we say green jobs, not jails, for New York City. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Annette. Um, I think we might have maybe just one minute for a question. If, uh, if Catherine, if you can open the line, we'll uh, see if we have one question. Certainly. If once again, if you would like to ask your question, please press star one on your touchtone phone. One moment for the first question. Great. And while we're waiting for that, um, Nick, can you touch on briefly how y'all determine which areas of the green economy you want to work in? I mean, you obviously touch on so many, from you know urban forestry to solar panel installation to home weatherization. How do you determine what areas you want to work in? Um, we 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 go all over. We we now in every area of the Bronx. 
the Bronx is our home base, so we just find areas. And when we're out with meetings, we find if we can find an area that's a block long that wants energy efficiency, wants to know about it, or a home building home builders association, we'll work on their area if they're willing to have us. And Parks Department, we're all over in the Bronx. Okay, short and simple. And do you have any questions in queue? We have no questions at this time. All right. Well, we are top of the hour, so we will hold a, hold it at that. Um, we, we like not to keep people too much later than the hour. So um, with that, I, I want um, to know that the presentations, the recorded session, and a resource list will be available in about one week, and we'll email everyone um, what that link is after uh, – Afterwards, for anyone who's uh, able to complete this survey for us, it should take just a couple of minutes, and this really helps us to refine our program, so please do complete this. But the next webcast session is on May 20th. It's uh, the third Thursday of the month, and it's Environmental Grudge Match, Solar Panels versus Trees. That's a good one. Thank you. Yeah, we're, uh, we're enough to be uh, setting the stage here. <laughs> so... Uh, Please take the survey. Uh, really, again, this, this does help us to improve our programming, and we will send the link out to everyone afterwards. So with that, I want to thank our presenters, uh, BJ, Ronnie, and uh, Dave, I believe, was uh, the third part of the crew, as well as Pat from Sustainable South Bronx, all the participants who joined us today, and our sponsors for the call, the Home Depot Foundation and the USDA Forest Service. Thanks for getting us together. Thank you. Thank you. This will conclude today's conference. All parties may disconnect at this time.